morning, everyone, and welcome to the in Internal Medicine Department Grand Rounds. Uh, it is actually our last one of the season, and uh, as we break for the summer, and we'll come back in the fall. Um, but I encourage you to just uh, spend some time over the summer replaying them and get onto the Cardinal Minute and uh, remember all the things that we've gone through this year, which have been absolutely incredible. Uh, and no less is today, we have Dr. Jason Chesney, who's professor of medicine and, uh, and pharmacology and toxicology and biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, he is our division chief in medical oncology and the director of the James Graham Brown um, uh, Foundation. He also is uh, the, uh, there's so many titles <laughs> uh, that, in, that include uh, the fact that he is running the, our cancer center and he will be speaking today on uh, using cellular immunotherapies to induce durable objective responses in cancer patients. Um, Dr. Chesney has been a longtime member of our faculty here at University of Louisville. Uh, he actually is a Minnesota Golden Gopher, um, where he studied anthropology and then did a PhD in biomedical sciences uh, before uh, graduating from medical school there in 1998. Um, he spent some time in New York and at Sloan Kettering um, at Cornell, and uh, we are so happy to have him uh, show up in uh, Louisville. Uh, it looks like it's exactly 20 years ago, and he has been on, on the, the path of ascension uh, until he's leading one of the best cancer centers that we have in the nation. So thank you so very much, Dr. Chesney, for sharing uh, your wisdom and all of your experience with us today. Well, thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, that was a wonderful introduction. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I'd like to start by just talking a little bit about uh, Kentucky uh, and the, the cancer death rate here and, and then the Cancer Center before I get into the topic of uh, my presentation. Uh, I, I've mentioned this to quite a few of you already, but some of you may not know this, but we're right in the, the dead center of the uh, what we call the Valley of Death. Uh, where cancer deaths are at the highest rates. And that's this, this, this valley right here, which basically stretches through Ohio, down into Kentucky, down into Tennessee, et cetera, uh, all the way to almost touching Texas. And there are two reasons for this. One, obviously, is, is heavy smoking rates, but the other is the absence of high-density uh, comprehensive cancer centers. Uh, so we're right at ground zero for cancer. Uh, we have the highest rate of cancer-related deaths in the, in the country. Uh, West Virginia uh, occasionally beats us out at that uh, dubious honor, uh, but but right now that is still the case. The other uh, fact I'd like to share with everyone is the fact that, let's say there's, I don't know how many are on the call, uh, probably around 60, I suppose, uh, so about half are men and half are women. Of the, of the 30 who are men, uh, 15 are going to get cancer. One in two men get cancer in their lifetime and one in three women get cancer. And uh, approximately one in three men will die of cancer and one in four women will die of cancer. The epidemiologists, uh, uh, this was all done uh, in the mid around 2015, 2016, predict based on the, the growth rate of uh, the population and the incidence of cancer, which is not dropping, uh, they believe that uh, we will see a 50% increase in the uh, number of patients with cancer in the next 20 years. Uh, I think that's a vast understatement to tell the truth. Uh, that has to do with the fact that historically we reached an equilibrium in most of our oncology outpatient clinics where patients would come in, uh, we would treat them for some period of time, six months, a year, and then they would pass and new patients would come in and so on and so on. Uh, but what has changed dramatically today because of immuno-oncology and new immunotherapies is that patients are coming in and, and they're, they're not passing. Uh, they're, they're staying with us and our clinics are growing uh, significantly at the Brown Cancer Center. We're experiencing a 10% uh, growth of new patients and follow-ups and uh, 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 infusions and radiotherapy, et cetera. And, and it has to do with the efficacy of our treatments. And, and that's nicely shown here. This is from the uh, NCI. And uh, the top line is, is the, the, the male uh, per number of deaths, the brown line, and the lower line with the arrows is, is the female. And you can see there's quite a disparity there of almost 100 deaths per 100,000. Uh, that likely has uh, to do with, there's no way to know for sure, but it likely has to do with uh, lifestyle choices uh, and the fact that most men don't like to go see their doctors, as most of us know. But the average, you can see, sits at about back in 1975 when we all got to watch the Marlboro Man on TV. 
Uh, we had about 200 deaths uh, nationwide per 100,000 of the population. And now we're down to uh, just below 150 deaths per 100,000. So uh, the death rate is certainly dropping, which is really good news. A little bit about the cancer center. Uh, doc, Dr. Williams uh, wasn't here uh, for the last 20 years and, and he and I have had a, a nice conversation already, but he probably doesn't know that the cancer center was originally built as a research institute. Uh, it was 1977, a group of uh, local community leaders got together and uh, realized that uh, their loved ones uh, were being sent out of state, uh, that cancer was uh, not a disease you didn't talk about, but a real disease that was uh, killing. And so they got together and raised about $12 million uh, and, and built the center. Uh, it was about 80% research. The, the top two floors were nothing but uh, uh, labs. Uh, the, the second floor had an auditorium, uh, had uh, four rooms and, uh, with, with you know, exam tables and, and a, a couple of infusion chairs. Uh, and that's what it was when I got here in 2002. Uh, it hadn't changed one little bit. And my lab was on the uh, third floor of the cancer center. And since then, we've, we've significantly uh, expanded the clinical operation, obviously. Uh, it was, and I should have mentioned the, the cancer center had, one of the main reasons they built it was there was no radiotherapy in Kentucky. And so uh, it was built with seven vaults, which even today is a incredibly large number of vaults. Uh, and the thought was that uh, the radiotherapy would, would in fact drop the cancer death rate in Kentucky by having ready access to that. The research uh, didn't really go anywhere. In 1999, when Don Miller got here, my predecessor, there was only one R01 at the cancer center. But uh, with his wisdom and vision and, and uh, scientific background, we saw a marked expansion of laboratory research. It was organized into five scientific programs. Eventually, we, we moved out of the cancer center and into the clinical and translational research building. That was in 2009 and created several cores. We have five cores there now. Uh, and then in 2017, uh, I became director and recognizing that uh, radiation and chemotherapy weren't going to cure advanced cancer patients and, and thus not drop the, the cancer death rate, I decided that we should refocus our efforts on cancer immunology and immunotherapy. Uh, and that had largely to do with some of the trials I'm gonna show you in a moment. And so this is the cancer center by, by numbers. Our UofL health operating budget is about $135 million each year. Uh, the UofL budget uh, this year was $27 million. Uh, we have 78 oncology faculty and 30 uh, cancer researchers uh, that we sponsor. The oncology faculty bring in 166 million in collections. Uh, the scientific faculty have just under $11 million in extramural funding. Uh, the state supports us with tobacco master settlement uh, monies, uh, as well as a, a portion, a half a penny off the dollar ten of cigarette tax uh, we get, which adds up to about uh, combined adds up to just under five million. Uh, the University of Louisville uses IGT funds uh, that are uh, generated with the Medicaid population uh, to support uh, the, the cancer center and the oncology uh, research to the tune of five million a year. Uh, we have a lot of donor support. You know, cancer uh, kills uh, thirty-year-olds and forty-year-olds and fifty-year-olds and uh, loved ones and uh, work colleagues, and and so it touches everybody. Everybody who's listening to me right now knows someone who. Has, has had cancer and likely know someone who's died of cancer. So we have 20 endowed chairs that range from one to $2 million. And we, uh, we, we bring in about two to 3 million a year in, in philanthropy. Uh, our goal is to get that to around six to $7 million. And that's what we're working on. Uh, the lab space is in the clinical and translational research building. Two, we have two floors two through four, which is about 60% uh, of the building. Uh, the clinical space exists. There's three outpatient facilities, one downtown, uh, which is our flagship center, uh, one here where I am at Northeast, and one at Bluegrass Avenue uh, in the South End, and then two, two inpatient wards, uh, six South and, and five East. Uh, there's five scientific cores. Our cancer trials program has really grown. When I got here, there were only four research nurses, uh, and they had a box that they put the informed consent forms. Uh, that's how they kept track of how many patients they accrued. Uh, now we have 34 FTEs. I'm not sure how many research nurses are in there. I think it's like 11 or so, supporting over 100 trials. The trials are currently open both downtown and northeast. Uh, and then we've reduced our, our scientific programs down to three uh, and uh, reflecting sort of where our strengths are. Uh, the first big one is experimental therapeutics. Uh, that's been, that was developed uh, by Dr. Miller. 
Uh, we fuse the molecular targets program and the experimental therapeutics program. And, and that the goal there is to identify new targets and then make small molecules against those small those those targets and then get them into phase one trials. Uh, my own lab uh, identified an enzyme called 6 phosphofructose 2 kinase, and we developed with this program developed a small molecule inhibitor that made it into a phase one trial. Uh, so that that's one big program. Uh, the second uh, on the right there is cancer care and delivery. That's I should say that experimental therapeutics is now led by Levi Beverly, uh, who is uh, the chief uh, of the section chief for the the research uh, section in the division of medical oncology. Uh, the second one I mentioned I want to mention is cancer care and delivery. Uh, uh, that's run by uh, Mike Egger. Uh, Mike's an incredible surgical oncologist. He's the head of our uh, cancer committee now. Uh, he took over for Jeff Bumpus, and uh, he's he's running that group. And their goal is to, to uh, uh, test outcomes, do outcomes research, uh, and improve uh, efficiency of cancer care. And then the third area I want to talk about is immuno-oncology, and that's why we're here today. Uh, my PhD is in immunology. It, it said biomedical sciences, but it was actually in immunology. Uh, and uh, uh, my fellowship was in immunology, and uh, I'm a big believer in cancer immunology, and I'm going to show you why uh, right now. Uh, the program... <clears throat> has two goals. It's run by Jun Yan, who's a senior uh, cancer immunologist uh, in the Department of Surgery, their division of immunotherapy. He originally was in HEMOC, actually. Uh, it's to, to develop novel approaches to activate or reinvigorate innate adaptive immunity against cancer cells, so to, to find new drugs and new approaches to, to activate your immune system against cancer, and then to better understand uh, how cancer avoids your immune system. Uh, a lot of us believe today that we're all getting cancer. Uh, we're walking out in the sun and, you know, ultraviolet radiation is transforming melanocytes, which in turn are becoming predysplastic and your immune system seeing mutant proteins. You know, it's constantly being presented in association with class one MHC and CD8 uh, T cells are, are getting rid of those, uh, those melanocytes that are uh, transforming. Uh, but at some point, the right combination of mutations leads to a combination of mutations that drive survival and proliferation but also drive immune evasion. And so that's a big area of study uh, in this program. Uh, the, an update, uh, we did create, I think it was now two or three years ago, a new division of immunotherapy. That's where Junyan is the chief uh, in the Department of Surgery with six faculty. And uh, I have a, a seventh recruit planned next year. Uh, four of those faculty were transferred from the Department of Medicine. Uh, we received a $12 million COBRA grant to establish the first Center for Cancer Immunology and Immunotherapy in the United States. Uh, it was uh, awarded uh, three years and four months ago, I think, to the day. And we're putting in our renewal at the end of next week uh, for another five years. It's been an incredibly successful uh, center. Uh, we have one new endowed chair in immuno-oncology. Uh, that's Dr. Kavitha Yenanapudi. She's in the Department of Surgery, and then two new Bucks for Brain endowed professorships uh, that we just matched with donors uh, for bioinformatics and computational biology. Uh, we've identified one of them who will be joining us in August, uh, and then we're, we're posting for uh, the other one. Uh, the, the Brown Cancer Center supported this program with $2.4 million in donor and state funds to purchase a Cytov and Hyperon Imager. These, these take the place of flow cytometry, where you have lots of issues with uh, fluorescence, uh, 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 and you get uh, squelching. Uh, instead of using fluorescent dyes to detect antigens, you use uh, metals. So you can use mass spec. Uh, so you can do this both with time of flight uh, for single cells and with uh, tissue sections. And uh, it, it's really a dramatic improvement uh, when you used to be able to do 16 antigens on a single T cell. Now you can do up to 64, apparently. Uh, and so there's just going to be thousands of new discoveries uh, with this technology. Our cell therapy program that I'm going to go into some detail about now uh, really got uh, supercharged with some gifts. Uh, one from the Gibbs Foundation gave us one and a half million dollars over three years. And then uh, the Kentucky Pediatric Cancer Research Fund supported us with two million dollars. And then Tom Dunbar uh, uh, lost the son at a young age to neuroblastoma and actually lost his battle with cancer recently. Uh, he has a foundation, and they supported us with uh, $2 million to create the Dunbar CAR T-cell GMP facility. So why did we end up where we are? How did we end up going from experimental therapeutics, developing small molecules to get into phase one trials, to uh, trying to really build out a big immuno-oncology program? Well, the main reason is that um, there was a lot of interest by myself and others 
at the Brown Cancer Center in the early 2000s in developing new, um, new uh, immunotherapies for testing in uh, cancer patients. And part of the reason for that was I had started as a melanoma oncologist here, and we would occasionally see patients who had spontaneous regressions of their tumors associated with vitiligo. And vitiligo is an autoimmune disease that targets melanocytes. And so it was clear that these regressions that we were observing uh, were, were likely immune mediated. And we were trying everything we could. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of our trials didn't work, but some that did are, are in front of, are on the screen right now. Uh, the first one there was a phase one and two uh, trial of anti-CTLA-4, uh, which is the, the first immune checkpoint inhibitor to be discovered by Jim Allison. Uh, uh, we were trying to activate T cells of all those years, uh, but in fact, it turned out T cells had their own internal break. And these were antibodies that were created to block that break. Uh, and then we started combining uh, uh, antibodies to hit different immune checkpoint proteins uh, and testing uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors in combination with oncolytic viruses, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to just talk about one of the trials here. I've, I've shown this at Grand Rounds before, and it's, it's quite dated. Uh, the first patient I put on the trial was in 2012, and she is still active on the trial. She's been coming every two weeks to the Brown Cancer Center because she decided to continue treatment, which the trial allowed for. Uh, the trial was to test the combination of an anti-CTLA-4 with an anti-PD-1. And what are these things? Well, CTLA-4 stands for cytotoxic T lymphocyte antigen 4. It was a, it was a gene discovered in, in CD8 positive T cells that were had differentiated into cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Uh, uh, when they knocked it out, uh, what they found was instead of expecting to see an immunodeficient uh, C in the mouse, you actually saw activation of the immune system and, and they rightly deduced that this was turning off the T cells. So it's an off signal. I've put these red bars in here. So if you signal through CTLA-4 with its ligand B7 in this case, you can turn off the tumor specific T cell. And likewise, uh, PD-1 stands for program cell death one. Uh, it was discovered in a leukemia line actually. And um, uh, what they found was if you knocked it out, the, the cells would grow, grow more rapidly because it was an off signal. And uh, uh, it turns out it's also expressed on, on CD8 positive T cells and CD4 positive T cells. And if you uh, uh, use an agonist antibody or a ligand like PDL1, which is overexpressed on cancer cells, you can turn off the T cells. Well, humanized antibodies were made. Uh, we started with an anti ctla 4 had some good, good results, not great. Uh, had about 20% long-term survival, which beat the his, historic 5% in stage four melanoma. Decided to combine it with a PD-1 uh, inhibitor. And uh, really it was just a, a moment in time that I'll never forget because uh, what happened was the majority of the patients who went on the trial uh, uh, had responses. And so you're looking at a waterfall plot here. Uh, each of the columns uh, is a single patient. And uh, you're just looking at the, the change in, in the, the size of the tumors after uh, four doses of an anti-CTLA-4 with an anti-PD-1. You can see the vast majority of the patients responded in, in, in melanoma. I mean, we were lucky to get a 10% response rate and it usually lasted about uh, three months uh, at the time. And so this was the, the anti-CTLA-4 data by itself. And this was the combination of hitting both of the immune checkpoint proteins it was really a, a revolutionary change in our attitudes and our direction uh, when it happened. Uh, it happened again in 2012, 13, and 14. We published in 15. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Posto at uh, Sloan Kettering, uh, beat me out for the first author slot by a couple patients, I was told, uh, but I was pretty junior at the time, and I think he was even more junior. So I hope one day he sees this video. <laughs> this was a patient on the trial. And you can see uh, the patient had a large chest wall mass, uh, and after treatment, it looked like a surgeon had cut it out. Uh, and, and we really got to get a, a, a good look at what the immune system could do. In patients who had, at the time, an eight-month uh, median overall survival, uh, most we would take care of for about uh, that period of time plus, and we would give them treatments that didn't work and made them miserable uh, in retrospect. But we would cure a few, 5%. This was that patient's, uh, just, just a photograph of that patient's tumor. And so from that early data with melanoma, which melanoma has the highest uh, mutation burden, uh, the second uh, highest is with non-small cell lung cancer, both adeno and squamous, uh, we, we expanded and started doing trials in lots of other cancer types. And, and now we have, uh, not only do we have more immune checkpoint inhibitors that target those two 
proteins, uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1. Uh, we also have immune checkpoint inhibitors that target the ligand of the PD-1, which is PDL one uh, You can see the number of cancers that we now use these drugs in. Uh, this goes out to 2020. I think it's grown from here to tell the truth. And so uh, the, the real focus of this talk uh, is, is on cell therapies. Uh, and so there's a lot of work right now looking at trying to find more immune checkpoint proteins. Uh, a third one was identified and has been uh, targeted, and that's LAG3. And there's a drug, rilatinumab, uh, that we're combining with nivolumab, uh, which is a PD-1 inhibitor. And so that, that whole area is continuing. Uh, targeting the immune invasion uh, is continuing. Uh, but uh, there's a, an old cell therapy, almost like a bone marrow transplant type of therapy uh, that I would send patients to, to the NCI in Bethesda. Uh, there was a there is a surgeon there who uh, developed the program uh, with taxpayer dollars uh, and uh, his name's Steve Rosenberg. Uh, and uh, he saw some very dramatic uh, effects of, of these cells. And uh, eventually, uh, the, uh, the approach uh, was commercialized into multi-center uh, clinical trials. And so we started, we were sending patients off and I wanted to develop a program here in Louisville so I didn't have to put them on an airplane because that's what the cancer center is all about. Uh, and I was fortunate to have been uh, doing a site visit at Moffitt Cancer Center and bumped into one of Steve Rosenberg's old postdocs, Jim Mulay, who's now a, a scientific leader down there. And uh, he, he told me about a, a new company that was looking uh, to, to, to do a multi-center trial. And I got on the phone with them immediately and, and talked to their CEO. Uh, and that was back in 2015. So what, why, why does this make sense? And, and so let me tell you what, when most people think about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, they think of it as a pathologic um, metric, right? You, you get a pathology report on, a, on a, a, a breast tumor or a melanoma or a lung lesion, and they'll say, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are present, right? And and you can, I don't really have to explain what tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are, right? They're 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 T cells and B T, T cells and B cells uh, that have infiltrated NK cells infiltrated a tumor, uh, and that we see when we look at the tumor. And a lot of times we'll look at slides, and ninety percent of the tumor is nothing but inflammatory cells, and then you see a little sparse outcropping of some melanoma cells. Uh, and so uh, they're, they're there, we've known they're there. And what uh, Dr. Rosenberg did was, he was a surgeon, he, he took the tumors out, isolated the T cells, expanded them, put the patient in the hospital, uh, initially gave it, uh, initially gave them the, the, the TILs as we call for short, but then the, the procedure developed to include lymphal depletion, then TILs, and then high dose interleukin-2, which got FDA approved in 1998. It, it was originally called T cell growth factor, so that's why he gave it. Um, he even went as far as doing total body irradiation to eliminate the existing immune system and probably all of the suppressor cells. Uh, it did improve the response rate, but uh, didn't improve overall survival. So that, that's no longer used. And so we do this because those tills are sitting in a microenvironment in the tumor that has basically been evolved in the body to suppress the immune system because you can't survive if you're a cancer cell and the immune system clears you. So there are lots of immunosuppressive metabolites and cytokines and cells that turn everything off. Uh, their intent is probably to keep us from all developing autoimmunities, but the tumor usurps them to use for immunosuppression. And so these immunosuppressive molecules and cells in turn produce the C4 and C8 positive uh, T cell effector functions that we need to kill cancer cells. And the hypothesis is that if you give back a ton of these cells that already are specific for the tumor antigens that were already sitting in the tumor, they'll home to the tumor and eat it. That's the idea. And so uh, this was been, been done uh, for many years at the National Cancer Institute and a few other centers started doing it, uh, but then became uh, a multi-center trial where we use a centralized processing facility, which uh, changed everything. Because now you could, you could uh, very efficiently resect a tumor, send it to the, the facility and get the cells back. Um, and the hope is that the hope was at the time that we were going to be able to do this uh, at, at Brown Cancer Center. And in fact, that's what happened. And I am frozen. Hold on. There we go. So this is the, the schema. Uh, you, if you look on the upper left, I will go back to my laser pointer, I think. Patient intake. Uh, they come and see me. I take a look at their scans. I then call a surgical oncologist. They're on the, the 
they're right there. I can't see them because of the Zoom thing, but uh, by memory, I don't know what order this is going to be, but I'm, I'm thinking it's Jared Little, uh, Victor Van Berkel, Mike Egger, and then Kelly McMaster, so I can see peeking out from below. And that's my team that I work with, and I, I look at the scans, and I talk to them, and I say, can you take one of these things out safely? And they always say yes. Uh, and so we get the tumor and the next step is we ship it off to IOVANCE, which is the cell processing facility. It's now in Philadelphia and they chop it up and isolate the T cells and expand them and put them into a bag, uh, and crowd preserve them now and, and ship them back to us. And they get uh, put into our stem cell lab, which is run by Rob Evans, uh, until the patient's ready to go in. Uh, the patient goes to our transplant floor where we do a non blade of lymphodepletion regimen with cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, very commonly used. They call it Cyflu for short. Uh, five to seven days of that, and then a, a single infusion of the TILs, and then up to six doses of high-dose interleukin-2. And uh, uh, we've been doing this now since 2016. Uh, last year, I was told we were uh, the, the busiest center in the country. Uh, that's uh, by IOVANCE themselves. Uh, we were doing uh, treating the most patients in the country at that time. Uh, the FDA approval for this approach in melanoma uh, is expected at, in the fall. Uh, IOVANCE has put forth a, a BLA uh, and the FDA is currently reviewing it. And so uh, we initially published the first 66 patients uh, about a year and a half ago in Journal of Clinical Oncology and the trial was expanded to 153 patients. Uh, uh, and we published that in December, so just three or four months ago. And th these are the results. Uh, uh, we had all the patients were heavily pretreated. 100% had received anti-PD-1, and the vast majority had received both an anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4. They had a high disease burden. Uh, we're, we're allowed to measure up to five tumors, uh, but a lot of times it's only one or two, depending on the patient. Uh, and you can see that uh, we were measuring the average or median was 98 millimeters, so 10 centimeters of tumor burden just for our target lesions. That doesn't include all the other lesions. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, with the 153 patients, we had an objective response rate of 31% and had eight complete responses and 40 partials. And uh, we do see durability uh, uh, in about half the patients. The median dur duration of response was um, uh, not reached. Uh, so it's very durable. And, you know, you hear 31%. And when I talk to my patients, I'll say 31%. But we, in the old days, we used to use something called clinical benefit, and, and we actually see a lot more clinical benefit, and that includes stable disease. So if your tumors don't grow and they don't spread, you're not going to die. And, and these days, you can really keep patients' symptoms uh, under control with uh, medications. And so this is called a, a Sankey plot. Um, if you've never heard of one, you're like me, because uh, when the statisticians put it together for IOVANCE, uh, I had never heard of one. Uh, but what you're looking at is uh, this is the this is the journey, the treatment journey of every individual patient on that trial. So there's 150 individual lines here, these gray lines that swirl around. And you can see that uh, all the patients had one line of therapy. This says ICI monotherapy. Um, here, I think it says chemotherapy, ICI combinations, so probably anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, targeted therapy. And then all the patients had a second line of therapy. So here's their second lines of therapy. And you can see the patients who had ICI monotherapy for the most part went down here into the ICI combination. So a lot of them started with an anti-PD-1 and then went to an anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4. Uh, some of them dropped down here into targeted therapies, which are BRAF inhibitors and so on and so on. And way out here on the far right is someone who actually had uh, uh, 10 lines of therapy who went on this trial. Uh, I said that the median was uh, three lines therapy. You can see one, two, three. The vast majority of patients had three lines of therapy before they ended up with uh, the, the IOVANCE TIL product, which we call Lifolucil. Now, here's the waterfall plot. And I mentioned 33% uh, because you can see that uh, the vast majority of patients had a response, right? Their tumor shrunk, their index lesion shrunk. Uh, not just 30, 30% or so, 31%. Uh, and each, again, each one of these an individual patient um, uh, a very small percentage of the total population actually grew uh, at the first uh, Im imaging uh, uh, time point. And the, the swimmer's plot, which is like, they, they, I think the statisticians came up with swimmer because it looks like an Olympic swimming pool, uh, was, was very positive. Uh, the patients who had PRs to start uh, a significant portion, uh, around half, uh, had durable responses that continued uh, long after uh, the treatment. So it was a single treatment and about half of the responders had uh, durable uh, responses. And the toxicity, uh, 
is that the actual till product is, is an autologous product. It certainly has dimethyl sulfoxide in it as a preservative. So if you have a reaction to that, that can cause a problem. I've never seen that. And I've treated about uh, uh, 60 patients. Um, the, most of the toxicity are, are known toxicities, meaning uh, you give chemotherapy and the, the hemoglobin and the platelets and the white cap drops, right? The whole goal is to cause an absolute lymphopenia, uh, lymphopenia excuse me. And so those are, you know, a known established adverse events. Uh, we do see significant toxicity with high dose interleukin-2. Uh, you have to put the patient uh, on tele. They need a quad lumen. Uh, you, you give renal dose dopamine. A lot of times they drop their pressure. Uh, they become tachycardic, so you frequently have to go up on pressors. Uh, the good news is that high dose interleukin-2, when we looked at our data, uh, the statisticians at IOVANCE uh, told us that uh, if, if you got one dose of high dose IL-2 or six dose of high, high dose IL-2, it didn't matter in terms of objective response rate. So if a patient has any toxicity from it after the first dose, I feel very comfortable stopping them. So I'm going to run through some clinical examples now. Uh, uh, and I'm going to start with a, a gentleman uh, who was referred up from, I think it was Owensboro, he's an out-towner, uh, who had melanoma in 2020. Uh, he was uh, treated with um, adjuvant nivolumab, which is an anti-PD-1, uh, I think OSH, I'm not sure, is that Ohio State Hospital maybe? I don't know, or it's Owensboro, no, it's one of the two, I don't remember where, <laughs> it may have been Ohio State actually. Uh, he then uh, underwent a right inguinal basin uh, resection for recurrence and uh, oddly enough got radiation, that's not standard care, but he, he got radiation to it. And uh, the, the local oncologist added uh, ipilimumab to the nivolumab, so went for the big guns uh, when he recurred like that, but then was found to have uh, multiple hepatic metastases and referred to us uh, for TILS. And uh, this is his uh, CT at baseline prior to getting TILS, and you can see uh, very large uh, hepatic metastases. Uh, I picked a good one to show you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and in both uh, hepatic lobes, and uh, he received the TIL product, had a dramatic partial response up front that, that persisted, and I just saw him uh, in the clinic and got a nice clean scan for you to look at, and you can see he has some treatment remnants that I'm not showing you. I think if I went a, a few slices in, you might see it, but I wanted to match it up with this uh, the, the sort of the, the most dramatic uh, slice um, from two years ago. So he's essentially been cured of his stage four melanoma, uh, and this isn't a patient frontline. This is a patient who's already been given every FDA approved option he can get. He was BRAF wild type and he was being told you should get your orders in, in, uh, uh, together and you should, you know, this is it. Anything we do now is just going to cause you more harm. And, and he's alive and well today as a result of this cell therapy. So, you know, you see these scans day in and day out and you get pretty excited and you get pretty driven. Uh, a second example, much more um, recently, uh, this was just a few months ago, a uh, young a lady about my age, I think she's around 50, uh, uh, had a left nasal mucosal melanoma. And muco if, if, you, if you think cutaneous melanoma is bad, mucosal melanoma is much worse. Uh, it was resected. They radiated her. Uh, she recurred. Uh, they rec <laughs> they, she recurred in the left submandibular lymph node. I thought it was a question. <laughs> Uh, which if anyone has a question and wants to stop me, feel free to. <laughs> uh, so she recurred, she got neoadjuvant, if you need, we're doing a lot of neoadjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitors these days in lung and melanoma, then underwent a big le left neck dissection, and then unfortunately recurred in C5, uh, got SBRT, and then was given Keytruda, uh, and then recurred again in the left nasal pharynx and had resection, and then developed a large right upper lobe lung lesion, as well as a hepatic met. And so uh, again, mucosal, she was CKIT negative, she was BRAF negative, there were no targeted agents. Essentially, there was nothing that you could do for this lady but give her palliative chemotherapy, so she was referred to us. And here are her images. Uh, I'm trying to keep this as de-identified as possible, so I didn't list the months, but uh, this was earlier this year. Uh, and you can see that's not a small uh, lung mass, uh, that's easily 15 by 5 or something like that in the uh, right upper lobe. I don't think I need to circle it for anyone. And then this is an MRI of her uh, liver met. Uh, she was at, at University Hospital, I think for her resection or something. And they told me that they could actually feel this liver met uh, in her abdomen very easily. 
So she got her tills and you can see what happened uh, to her lung lesion and her liver met is still visible, but again, you know, this is an immune infiltration. Her immune system has been turned on and uh, her C8 positive T cells have eaten her melanoma cells. So a very good dramatic uh, response that we just got uh, uh, literally a, a few weeks ago. And this lady I've mentioned to this group before, uh, this is Val Snap. Uh, she was uh, treated early on, I think it was 2018 or so. She was went to MD Anderson was, uh, for Tills and was told she was too old. She was 73 at the time. And um, in my belief, you're never too old. So she got on the phone with me and she's from Nashville. She Vanderbilt had already said, no, they don't, they don't have much of a cell therapy program. And so she came up and we screened her and I got a waiver. Uh, the, the maximum age is 70 for the trial. I got a waiver, we treated her and she had a CR and she's still alive today. And, and University of Louisville uh, Magazine did a nice piece on her and you can see her big uh, uh, big mediastinal mass there that just completely resolved. And so like with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, we jumped very quickly to lung cancer um, and we have multiple trials open for non-small cell lung cancer right now. Uh, the big one is the uh, second line, uh, which is really going for um, the potential to go, go into a, an FDA approval process. Uh, so the patients have to have had chemoimmunotherapy uh, for the, the main trial that we're, we're doing. I'm gonna show you an example of a patient who was on a basket study where uh, you didn't have to have any chemo, you could have just had an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So this lady had a new right upper lobe, non-small cell adeno. Uh, she had, there were some performance issues, uh, but they were minor. Uh, her, her lung cancer had 100% PDL1 expression. Uh, so the medical oncologist, uh, whose name is Fong No, uh, decided to um, skip the chemo and just go for an anti PD1 because the patients who have that very high level of PDL1 tend to respond uh, to just anti PD1s. And so she got it and did okay for a little while, but then developed a new uh, two centimeter uh, brain met and was given uh, radiation. Uh, and then uh, about a year after diagnosis was found to have progression with interval growth of splenic lesions and uh, intrathoracic lip endopathy and, and a, the, the, the right upper lobe mass was growing. And so she was referred uh, to me uh, for TILS and on the left is her presenting uh, scan. Uh, you can see the right upper lobe mass there uh, and then the splenic mass um, here. And, uh, you know, we're always making decisions about where to harvest. And uh, I, I tend to like the abdomen better <laughs> just because of, uh, especially in lung cancer, a lot of our lung cancer patients have smoked. Uh, and so I, I really wanted the spleen uh, lesion. And, and after talking with Dr. Egger, uh, we decided uh, that that would be the one to go with. So that's what was harvested. And you can see uh, after uh, treatment and two years, uh, it took a while for it to completely resolve. There was scar tissue and whatnot, but it looks like it's almost gone now. The right upper lobe lesion is gone. Uh, I was gonna joke around and say yes, and not only did the tills get rid of her, her tumor but in her spleen, but it got rid of her spleen, but Mike decided to take the whole spleen out. Uh, that was the safest approach for her uh, because taking a little piece of tumor out of a spleen, um, the, the bleeding risk is just too high. So again, now we have a, another CR, this one now in non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, Adrian Baker is the patient's name. She gave us uh, written permission uh, to talk about her and she's been written up. Uh, and this was obviously at the height of the pandemic with us, the masks. Uh, and uh, uh, I walked out of the room, I promised, and asked her to take her mask down. And I took a picture of her smiling because I, I could tell she was smiling uh, because she'd had such a traumatic response. And a, a second now more uh, recent example of a non-small cell uh, lung cancer patient, this that came from the University of Kentucky, was referred in and saw Dr. Cloker, uh, gets Cloker, uh, had persistent cough that was initially thought to be from COVID, uh, but then developed some mobility issues uh, that led them to do uh, imaging of the brain and then subsequently of the, the body and uh, was found to have four brain mets. Uh, uh, as well as uh, a mass in the lung and was given um, 9LA, I think, or a version of 9LA, uh, carbo, uh, 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 pemetrexa, which is an uh, antifolate, and then the anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4 combination, and, but then was known to have progression. We, we meet, in theory, every two weeks with UK on a Zoom uh, and share trials, and I got to present TILS about a year ago there, and then I did a follow-up last fall and so their lung cancer doctor knew about it and, and sent the patient here. And Dr. Cloker saw her uh, and you can see a fairly bad looking uh, 
right upper lobe here, uh, uh, right upper to middle, I think. Uh, I think that the mass is right here. You can see it right there. It might be a little bit smaller than my circle. The rest of this is just collapsed lung. This is all collapsed lung down there and down here. You can kind of see um, bronchioles going through there. Uh, and, and then this is some uh, mediastinal hilar lymphadenopathy. Uh, and so she had a, a fairly dramatic response at day 42 from the treatment. Uh, you can see uh, the, the tumors are virtually gone. And, and this just happened about three or four weeks ago, so I have no data on durability. And then the last example I'm going to show is a cervical cancer patient. And cervical cancer does respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, and so we've been slowly uh, trying to uh, treat patients. It's very difficult because their, their presenting treatment is pretty aggressive with radiation and surgery and lots of cytotoxic chemotherapies. So their performance status is horrible. Their kidney function is horrible uh, when, when they get to us. Uh, but I did get one early <laughs> uh, and it was a long time ago and I'm trying to get some more right now. Um, but this lady had an early stage cervical cancer picked up by PAP and then recurred in the lungs. And she was treated down in, uh, I think it's, I can't remember the name of the town, somewhere in Tennessee and progressed in the lungs and was given a variety of chemos you can see and, and then progressed in the lung and mediastinum in 2018 and, and came up here for chills. And uh, you can see this was her, her day 42 and you can see we didn't get as, as great of a response, but we did get a, a nice response. Um, and uh, the good news is this was in 2018. I, I kind of indicated I forgot to say because it's blocked the, the years these were done. Uh, and this lady is alive and well today. And I just got a copy of her scan report for this talk. I, was, I tried desperately to get her follow up imaging, but it's coming tonight, apparently. Um, but she has a stable nodule in her right upper lobe, which is probably not relevant, seven millimeters, some lower lobe opacities that are stable, and uh, some stable mediastinal on right hilar adenopathy. So she's basically NED based on the scan, that no evidence of disease. Uh, and and uh, living uh, her life now she's young. Um, I'll show you her picture. Uh, she did when she was here getting tills. We had some TV crew up here, I think, and and there she is. Her name's uh, Jennifer Phillips, a wonderful person. And what happened, and I've done this many times, is if I see any evolution, evolution meaning a bleeding tumor or a tumor that gets bigger and smaller and then bigger and smaller, um, uh, some small insignificant new nodules, things like that, even if it's not true progression. I will put the patient on a PD-1 inhibitor. And even though they've progressed on PD-1 inhibitors in the past, I'll do it because um, we believe that when we uh, lymphodeplete and then bring in, I mean, we're doing 50 to 100 billion tills that we're administering to the patient. When we do that, we're really um, reconstituting the immune system and uh, engendering it to be something that it's, that's different and that... It, uh, you know, if the cancer cells start producing PDL one to respond, right? It's it's a battle between your immune system and the cancer cells. Uh, An anti PD one can come in handy, and it did in this case because we put her on a PD one inhibitor, and uh, she's now still alive um, and and doing very well. I'm told down in Tennessee, and it's interesting. I've never had a patient referred uh, from Norton Cancer Institute, uh, not once. Um, I have had a patient from Baptist. Uh, and I've had a few from UK, but not one from Norton. Uh, we get uh, about a third of our patients do come, however, from out of state. Uh, the farthest was a lady I saw from uh, Northern California, uh, but Minnesota, Colorado, Texas, a lot from uh, Florida, Tennessee. We just get a ton from Tennessee, I guess, because we share a border. I think I have five exes there, but it's much more than that. Uh, uh, but we, we don't get a lot of uh, referrals from other healthcare systems. And so... To summarize uh, where things stand, uh, we are currently doing phase one to three trials for TILS. Uh, the new phase threes for melanoma is going to be a frontline for melanoma in combination with uh, pembrolizumab, the anti-PD-1. So we'll randomize patients to get pembrolizumab frontline versus TILS with pembrolizumab. Uh, we're doing cervical, non-small cell lung, head and neck. Uh, we're really focused on trying to understand what part of the TIL product is important. Is it the CD8 cells? Is it we think that's what it is. Uh, can we whittle it down? Because uh, there's literally thousands of subtypes of T cells in that product. Uh, and then understanding the impact that TILS has on the overall immune system uh, by looking at the tumors and looking at uh, uh, peripheral blood uh, immune cells using our Cytob. And that, that program is really run by Kavitha Yanapudi. 
uh, who's our, our Henry Volk Chair of Immuno Oncology. Uh, uh, new trials that are underway and, and about to happen are uh, a PD-1 knockout. The, the gene for PD-1 is PDCD-1. I think program cell death one, but somehow there's an extra D in there. I can't remember why, uh, but it's a knockout uh, with IOVANCE uh, that's open. Uh, we did the first three here in the world. Uh, and then they said, we got to do some at other centers. So we're going to do the next three at other centers to give you guys a break. Um, we're working with a, a, a company called Obsidian uh, that uh, wants to do an inducible IL-15, which is really exciting. Uh, IL-15 uh, is very good at uh, maintaining and expanding uh, memory effector CD8 positive T cells. And then Moffitt Cancer Center uh, has a CD40 ligand uh, uh, overexpressing TIL product that we're planning to open up here. So I have four slides on this. I, I'd be remiss if I was talking about cell therapies if I didn't talk about uh, this program. Uh, this is chimeric angin receptor or CAR T cells. Uh, there's uh, commercial CARs for, for B cell leukemias right now uh, that are having an impact, but we have a research program. Uh, we have our own CAR T cell GMP lab over in the Baxter building and uh, funded by the Dunbar Family uh, Foundation. Uh, CARs are essentially your own T cells that have been transduced with a, a virus that expresses uh, a chimeric angin receptor that's got the, uh, the, the domain, the signaling domain uh, for a T cell receptor on one end, but it has a, a sticky wicky antibody uh, for any angin you want to have on the other end. And so you can basically make a car for any surface protein you want to. And there are a lot of surface proteins that are overexpressed on cancer cells. Uh, that uh, you can do this with. Uh, Dr. Emmons is the director of this lab and, and the overall program. Uh, he is a, uh, he's part of our blood cancer cell therapy and transplant program, uh, uh, has an expertise in multiple myeloma. And he shared this slide with me. Uh, and this is basically the process. And what's nice about this is, unlike me, where I'm relying on IOVANCE to produce the TIL product, uh, uh, Rob can do it all in-house. So he we get the cells, we leukopherese the T cells from the patient. Uh, then we have a viral vector that expresses the CAR uh, construct. And Rob's team uh, uh, does the transduction in our GMP facility, ready for human use, makes the CAR T cells. Here's your signaling domain and your tar target binding domain uh, that's antibody derived. Uh, then they, they can expand them, uh, and put them in the white bag, in the bag like I get from IOVANCE and put them back in the patient. And they've done this three times successfully so far. Uh, in a trial with, that's a targeting CD4, interestingly enough. A lot of the leukemias and lymphomas are T-cell-derived, ALL, et cetera, uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and they overexpress CD4. Uh, so they've done three patients uh, with that, and we're, that's a phase one, so they're going to open it up now to multiple additional patients. Uh, this slide originally had three targets, and I was informed about five minutes before this talk that I wasn't supposed to show those. <laughs> by Dr. Emmons, and I'm, I'm proud to say that I was able to switch the slide out. Uh, that's why I was a couple minutes late, Dr. Williams also. Uh, and so, uh, but the targets are for AML, uh, multiple myeloma, uh, and ALL, T-cell ALL. And then I have a side project working on a GD2 CAR T-cell with Kavitha and Rob that will target melanoma and uh, neuroblastoma. Uh, it's interesting, the lab can only do one at a time, but you can purchase bioreactors to, that are self-enclosed to actually transduce the cells and expand them. So we've been purchasing them. I can't remember how many we have, but I think we're at, we're at the, we currently have the capability to do four at a given time in the lab because of the bioreactors. They cost about a half million each. And then a second area that's really exciting is, uh, and this is a little bit of immunology I'm not going to bore everybody with, but uh, T cells can be divided into thousands of different subtypes. I mean, it's just as it's wherever the technology takes us. But there are two main there are two main types of T cells that are important for cancer outside of NK cells. And um, alpha beta T cells are the main ones that we all learned about in medical school. But then there are T cells that have a slightly different T cell receptor. It's called the gamma delta T cell receptor. It's the alpha betas that we use to make CAR T cells. It's the alpha betas that everybody talks about, and uh, that's just the name of the subunits on the T cells. And, but alpha betas are the very uh, classical uh, T cell where they, you know, if you're a CD8 positive T cells, uh, you you find a, a cell that's expressing class one MHC uh, uh, in association with an angenic peptide, and the CD8, the alpha beta CD8 uh, complex T cell receptor will bind to it and kill a cell. 
Gamma deltas, however, can directly recognize proteins and phospholipids. So they're really kind of like a fusion or an intermediate between cognate immunity, which are the alpha betas, and innate immune cells like NK cells. Uh, and there's a company out of the University of Alabama that we got together with uh, that wants to do CARs with these cells because they seem to be uh, more effective than alpha betas. And uh, the difficulty is that they're very scant. They're, 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 they're rare in the peripheral blood. So you got to culture them for a long time to get them out. It's very complicated. And Rob has taken the helm and uh, as the clinical trialist and the GMP guy in his group. And they're doing this now. They're doing runs with these cells and getting ramped up to do uh, studies uh, against uh, glioblastoma and AML, acute myelobastic uh, leukemia. So my last slide, um, cell therapies obviously are a promising new approach for the treatment of cancer, number one. Uh, the Brown Cancer Center, U of L Health Brown Cancer Center has become a national leader in the development of novel cellular therapies. Uh, there's just no question about that. Uh, we were... Uh, we were the lead center for the, the biggest trial to ever test CAR T cells. Uh, and it is a trial that the FDA is using uh, to uh, base their decision on whether to approve the, the approach. Uh, TILs have certainly been proven to be effective in the refractory stage for melanoma. I showed you evidence of that. Uh, we see activity already in cervical cancer and non-small cell. I do believe that going earlier, uh, uh, doing this not after 10 lines of therapy, but doing it after just one line of therapy is the way to go. And even doing it frontline, I'm starting to become a believer. Uh, the two big responders in lung cancer so far have both been patients who did not get prior chemotherapy, interestingly enough. Um, uh, TILS uh, presents a great opportunity because you can genetically engineer cells. You have this window of opportunity from when the cells get produced. I mean, you can just make billions. I mean, you know, 150 billion if you want to. So you have plenty of cells to do transductions with, to genetically modify, and then put back in the patient. And then last but not least, the CAR T cell program, which again, CARs come from blood, TILs come from tumor, can be, they essentially just like TILs can be, uh, the only difference is that they are, can be targeted, right? So you're, we're creating a T cell receptor on those. The TILs, we, they already have the T cell receptor we want because they're, they're derived from the tumor. And I'm going to stop there and take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Chesney. That was absolutely amazing. I'm usually very reluctant to admit that anything is as interesting as cardiology, but, but <laughs> just talking about novel, uh, fascinating, and uh, dramatic cures. Um, let me uh, take chair prerogative and ask a couple of questions. One is it has to be a cardiology question. Um, we actually had a patient uh, on our service. So, we're, by, by the way, um, I think you might have gotten the award for the largest Grand Rounds audience when you include the seven people here up on seven uh, at University Hospital with my team. Um, so congratulations on that, owing to how um, fascinating um, the topic is. Um, but the cardiology question, of course, we did have someone admitted uh, who was about to get their tills and yeah. so I had to look it up and, you know, and really no difference in left ventricular ejection fraction in people who are treated versus not treated. Rare troponin leaks, uh, which are always make you start chasing people diagnostically, but about one out of seven will get atrial fibrillation and all, almost a third get hypotension. Now, before we get excited and start using it as an as a, as a a um, accelerated hypertension cure, cure uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about why there would be AFib and hypotension? Well, the it's not from the TILs themselves. We, we see AFib from the high dose interleukin too, uh, certainly. That, that's probably where you're, you're see, that's probably where that's coming from. We see hypotension from that as well. I and we see sinus tech. I mean, we see SVT. Um, we see uh, even the chemo, uh, the fludarabine. Uh, we kind of had a, an interesting experience with some fludarabine recently. And uh, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide can cause uh, SVT. Um, and so we're using that for lymphodepletion. So it's the TIL product itself isn't doing it. Um, now, uh, we just had an interesting case. Uh, I, I hate saying interesting case. We had a, a case of uh, uh, myocarditis uh, that can happen from high dose interleukin 2. So we, where the patient uh, became uh, had chest pain, uh, became tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, got an EKG and had diffuse ST elevations, uh, which was essentially in the setting of high dose IL-2 pathognomonic for uh, cardiomyitis. And so uh, we, we held the high dose IL-2 and, and supported them. And we called, don't worry, we call cardiology, uh, but, but it was, it's a known, known side effect of the high dose IL-2. And, and in fact, the, the, the interleukin-15 trial 
we're hoping will be a winner because you won't have to use Heidel's IL-2 in that setting. And so if we can get away from Heidel's IL-2, we can really move towards an outpatient setting for these patients. The only reason we're putting them in the hospitals for that. Fantastic. And yes, that indeed was our patient. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for calling us. So yeah. uh, the, the other quick question, and we'll open it up uh, to everyone, is uh, the, the earliest I saw of this treatment on your slide was uh, 2010. And if that's about right, then um, yeah, because another oncology patient we had admitted uh, uh, yesterday had a pathologic fracture after 14 years uh, of, of thought to be complete re remission, renal cell carcinoma. I mean, mm -hmm. late recurrence like that is just devastating. But the yeah. real question is, uh, I, so it's hard to ask you this question, but just mechanistically, would you think that uh, we could avoid those late recurrences for these uh, some of these terrible uh, cancers that do this on, on rare occasions? There's yeah. something about it that'll stop that from happening. Yeah, I, I think... I. I mean, we do today. I mean, the, the durability of the immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, is incredible. Now, I will say that if you stop them, you, you take some risks. So a lot of these patients are ending up on chronic, chronic infusions. Now, the longest recurrence I had was from 1964 to 2013. How many, I don't know how many years that is, 50 years. That was a recurrence of melanoma. So, you know, we, we do believe that the immune system works, but at some point it starts to uh, not work, right? And so I have a 95-year-old under active treatment with pembrolizumab who's done great for several years, and, and all of a sudden he's just progressing out of the blue, and I'm sure it's because he's 95 now, and your immune system becomes energic. And so it is a challenge, uh, but a lot of times when that happens, uh, immunotherapies work, intelligence, when you have late recurrences, uh, we tend to see, and it's because you're aging and your immune system's kind of, you know, fizzing out. Fantastic. So, Jason, do we we have sounds like we have some uh, questions in the chat or anyone yeah, who else? We have you? have one from uh, Dr. Kruger, and she wants to know. She says, compared to the progress in therapeutics, we are behind in treatments for side effects and proper nutrition. So, the Warburg effect indicates feeding protein is better because many tumors lack ability to utilize proteins for energy. Uh, can we collaborate on best nutrition practices? Um, sure. <laughs> so I'm. I'm aware of Otto Warburg's effect, and uh, you know the the I, I've spent quite a long time studying glucose metabolism in cancer cells, and uh, there's no question that cancer cells love to eat uh, glucose, uh, but they also they kind of eat everything to tell the truth. When people have done studies of, of tumors, metabolic studies in in humans and in mice, uh, and they'll eat amino acids, they just turn everything on because they're growing so rapidly. Uh, is there an opportunity to use diet to circumvent uh, that process? I, I think there is. Um, you know, a lot of my patients will say, well, if I just don't eat sugar, why well, don't I just starve the, the, uh, the tumor? It, it doesn't work that way because of insulin and glucagon and, and glucose homeostasis, obviously, but can you limit it? Maybe. Uh, and there was a study done in England where they compared uh, fruit juice versus high fructose sodas, right? They, they kind of parsed out some population with the expectation that the high fructose soda patients would have more cancer. And it turned out it was the fruit juice people who did. And so there's a lot to be learned, uh, and probably because there's plenty of glucose in the fruit juice people, right? And so who are drinking the fruit juices, uh, and I'm not trying to say to anyone to not eat lots of fruits and vegetables. My wife has informed me that that's very important. So I try to have a few each day. I steal them from my kids. But uh, uh, Chris, I agree 100% that there's a lot of opportunity there that, and, and, and in conjunction with uh, immunotherapies. Uh, I hope that answers that question. So, so you made a really good point that uh, is in the cardiovascular literature, Jason, which is juice is not healthy. Smoothie are, is, the difference is the fiber. And so yeah. when you put the fiber away, oh boy, it's not a fruit and vegetable anymore. Right. Uh, see. Uh, Dr. May wants to know, is um, a role, is there a role for meaningful exercise in prevention uh, and or treatment of cancer? Interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not, I know that there's a big role for cardiovascular uh, reduction <laughs> of cardiovascular risk, uh, and I, I, but I can't really say, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. So in breast cancer, I don't know if Dr. Riley's on, she's, she's in clinic like I am, so she probably isn't. But in breast cancer, I know that um, weight is a major risk factor for breast cancer. So that's one area. Uh, uh, but then, you know, there's so many uh, confounding variables, you know, like melanoma is a great example. Yeah, I got this guy who's completely healthy, runs five miles a day, 
big swimmer, weightlifter, but also is outside in the sun. Well, he ends up with melanoma. And then I have, you know, the, the, the classic um, couch potato uh, who, who doesn't, right? And, and because that's because they're not in the sun. So uh, to answer your question, I, I think it depends on the type of cancer. Um, I think no matter what exercise is, is the right thing for us all to be doing. Excellent. And a vegan diet, right, Dr. Williams? You bet. Um, but I have to say that uh, occasionally uh, vegans will go off in a direction that I think isn't completely evidence-based. And so there are cancer centers, as you know, say, come here, eat plants, and you'll get yeah. better. Yeah. I think, you know, you do a huge randomized trial before setting up a center. That would be my advice to them. Right. So, all right. Uh, I think we're up to the cardinal minute, exactly mm -hmm. nine o'clock. Um, so if we, if it's okay, uh, Jason, I think you have an announcement or two about the award ceremony. Right. Uh, just remember, everybody, next week is our annual awards day. Uh, it will be virtual again, uh, per Dr. Olgis, and uh, same Zoom link. It'll be next Thursday at eight a.m. Uh, just as just in the same time slot here. And uh, it's always a great participation. We love everybody to we love everybody to come and uh, support our uh, trainees and uh, um, you know fellows and residents and uh, as they their awards and the thing and as they're uh, we recognize them as they are, they're uh, um, moving on to the next phase of their uh, training and uh, their careers. And we hope everybody can join us. So it's a great, always been a great event and we really look forward to it. All right, fantastic. And thank you so much, Dr. Chesney. That was really marvelous. And uh, hopefully everyone will uh, join us for the Cardinal Minute uh, on, online, which uh, should be there in a few minutes. Uh, and so let's uh, end this and uh, Dr. Chesney and I and Jason will come back and uh, and get our recording. All right.